Hi, hello and welcome to this session. Today, we will be talking about how to do interconnectivity between applications across multiple clouds, multiple clusters, and even going all the way to the edge. Okay, um, first, also a little bit more about myself. My name is Hugo. I'm a Mexican currently uh, based in Massachusetts in the United States, and I am an open source advocate within Red Hat. I also consider myself a history, travel, and food, uh, food enthusiast. And I leave you here my tutorial handler if you want to follow up the conversation um, beyond this, this session. I will be in a chat, you'll be able to answer some of the questions, but you can also contact me uh, outside of this conference. And today we will be covering three main topics. So the first one is we will be talking about what are the challenges when using our applications and when uh, creating this architecture that will be expanding across multiple clusters and even going to the edge. The second topic that we will be covering today is how we do um, this interconnectivity of applications and why running things as, a, as is, if they are local, it's something that may be useful when designing your architecture. And for that, we'll be covering the concept of virtual application networks or BANs. And then finally, we'll be uh, introducing Scoper, this uh, project uh, for creating virtual application networks to be able to interconnect these applications. So we will be doing a quick overview of the technology of the project and how it relates uh, with Kubernetes and NH. And finally, as I was mentioning, we will be able to see a demo of these uh, kind of implementations. So let's get it started. And I, I do like this, uh, this picture because it really reflects the story and the transition between how I do start um, to feel when I am suddenly we are able to, uh, we are able to uh, create our applications and being able to run them first locally and then being able to deploy into one cluster. So most of the times we just, you know, package our applications, run our CI CDs, and that application is now available um, in our cluster. And it really feels like when, when, when you uh, relate with the, uh, with, the, with the Korean movie, it's when you get Gizmo for the first time, just this little cutie thing that you want to hang around and, and, and be friends with. And most of the times, this is because you feel that uh, that that um, that feeling of uh, being comfortable around those. And, and this is because the single cluster or the single cloud type of deployment um, allows us to have our applications under control from the connectivity perspective. If I have an application, for example, a UI or another service that needs to consume from my API, and that API needs to then connect to a database. It is very easy to easily route our connections through the exact same space because most of the times our cluster or our cloud will be sharing a single uh, networking configuration. So most of the time we will have uh, segments or um, even uh, uh, IP addresses and host names that are easily reachable within our cluster. So basically we have everything available within our reach. However, when we start to talk about, okay, now we need to move and have this application replicated across clusters running on different regions, or when we suddenly need to um, leverage the services of one hyperscaler instead of another and have certain components of our application being deployed in one uh, cloud provider and then the rest of the components in uh, another cloud provider or even in our own private data center because of you know um, uh, government regulations or uh, because of uh, the way that data gravity um, pulls uh, our uh, our information into uh, certain spaces or when we need to suddenly realize we need to cover some use cases that are more like edge related running a cluster on a branch location or even in a disconnected environment. So suddenly all this security thing that you had in the past really becomes uh, very, very complex and scary. So it's when, uh, when, uh, when you're um, 
this more type of, of ground just suddenly gets fed in the after midnight then it becomes this monster that is just creating chaos and making your life miserable so this is how i feel when suddenly i realize that my application discover all these scenarios and, and this is because the real world it has a lot of brownfield applications so i will think of uh, of going to the cloud on you know go and start using things like AWS Lambda and suddenly everything is cloud native and it's super easy to deploy. But that's not true for most of the, uh, the organizations. They do have a mix of environments that covers not only um, a traditional deployments on virtual machines and bare metal and servers uh, with even legacy systems or all uh, type of Unix systems or even mainframes and tandems running that have never stopped in, in, in the last 10 years. But also, we are uh, seeing organizations embracing things like uh, Kubernetes, uh, deploying multiple versions or multiple flavors and even multiple uh, distributions of, of Kubernetes, right? Because there's, it's like Linux, there's no one single uh, flavor for, for that or one single provider. We have several different vendors and Red Hat, for example, offers you one of the enterprise grade uh, through OpenShift. And also, when we are talking about connecting to other systems and other applications and other components, we certainly face uh, the uh, different and complex network topologies that have been cre being created uh, uh, along the time. So you will have um, firewalls, you will have a mix of, uh, of IP protocol, you will have VPNs, VPCs, and also uh, some conflicts or some networks that are conflicting and, and such because, you know, the API um, the IPA, uh, IP uh, address space was uh, was limited in the time. So you, you will need to uh, work around these kind of, of, of limitations. And that becomes a, a connectivity challenge. And one of the most uh, common use uh, challenges that we see in, in the field are these two. One is the uh, possibility to connect from the, plow, the, pro, the public cloud into the private cloud when suddenly, as I mentioned, we have data gravity running on top of, uh, of our all legacy database or the mainframe and suddenly we need to scale and, and for that we uh, make usage of uh, services from, from, from the cloud providers and we need to retrieve that information in, in, a, in a safe way and being able to connect both worlds. The other one is the edge-to-edge -edge connectivity. Suddenly we know that we need to connect two edge devices, but the networking between them is not reliable enough. And we want to use the public cloud as a way to connect these edge devices, uh, keeping up the, uh, the security and, and the control that we expect from a point-to-point -point connect connection. And for that, we have a possible solution that can help us to uh, work with this. So um, one of the things that we have been doing for a long time is creating this concept of a VPN, VPC, where we are able to use um, the same uh, range or the same uh, segment of the network for those services running on those different clouds, right? This is the most common uh, approach that we can find. And uh, in, in the last years, we also have seen the race uh, in the right side of the usage of the gateway, right? Because one of the challenges of the VPN is that when you start uh, connecting your, your segments and, and your networks, you need to start, uh, you know, building on top of the firewall rules to, um, to protect and, 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 and be sure that only certain uh, ranges or I of IPS are, are are available for the public cloud and such. So the gateway try to uh, try to fix that in, in a way that you simplify the uh, the, the points uh, exposed in, in your networking and you can protect them easily. But still, you need you will uh, need to be able to know exactly where you are connecting, what is the kind of protocol, the IP and, and the routing and, and such. So you still depend on on external um, connectivity components for that. In the case of, uh, for example, for Kubernetes, one of the solutions that um, some other projects uh, uh, propose, it's to have this flattened network across the different clouds, right? Where you uh, need to have a, um, a, a additional third party that is uh, uh, serving as a control plane and then can uh, manage and, articulate the, um, the uh, networking 
uh, and, and, and the configuration of, of your clusters in both sides of the, of the network, right? So things like Submariner, th th those are the kind of, of projects that are trying to, uh, to get this approach. And, and this works when you set up everything from the beginning, but at the end, it really gets too much complicated to start, you know, uh, checking that, that there is no collisions or that you need to handle the, the, the global CIDRs and, and such. So we will try to avoid going all the way to the networking level to solve these kind of things. And that's where the, that's the point where uh, things like the virtual application networks gets really interesting. So looking at this picture, uh, this is how I, I visualize uh, how a virtual application network works. If you have seen this um, this uh, this uh, movie in the past, you will see that the um, the Jedi Council has all these Jedi Masters available in, in in the meeting, but some of them are not really there. There's only their images or their holograms of, of the uh, of their person being sitting there but at the same time they're able to communicate and and and, and listen and and see what is going on in in, in this in, in the room so they're like like virtually there so people can interact with them but in in reality they are they are uh way, way uh, away from from that place so that's how uh, the virtual application uh looks like in this case the virtual application network is this abstraction layer between the networking uh, layer and the application services and processes. And the idea of this virtual application network is that your applications don't need to be modified. So it is something that needs to work with different protocols, HTTP, gRPC, messaging. So general TCP type of connectivity, like for example, for JDBC and databases, but the virtual application network needs to be able to handle this kind of connectivity because other services focusing focuses more on the uh, a, a specific um, networking or just for HTTP and, and such. The idea is to have something that is flexible enough, and obviously it needs to be something that plays well together with Kubernetes, with container uh, uh, runtimes and engines like Docker, for example, and even uh, native deployments on top of edge devices. And the most important thing is the virtual application network. It's that capability that allows us to have an independent application connectivity topology from the network implementation that we have in a way that we can have different network segments, different network administrators, but from the application perspective, everything looks like the same thing. And this is where uh, Scopper becomes handy because Scopper is this project that has been working on trying to implement this concept of the virtual application network. As they mentioned uh, themselves, Scopper tries to provide the secure connectivity at the workload level or the application level between different clouds, different sites, and even different networks. Instead of the infrastructure level, they just want to focus at the um, application or the workload level. So you can uh, check more on, 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 on the details of, of the project uh, going to uh, scopper.io or following them on Twitter at uh, scopper.io. And scopper is this, uh, as I mentioned, it's the implementation of a virtual application network. Um, it runs uh, with, um, with a deployment that runs on top of Kubernetes, vanilla Kubernetes, OpenShift, other, uh, other um, providers as we will see in on the demo, and also can run uh, using the implementation uh, of the container runtime that runs locally in, for example, your, your laptop. And it is built on top of the Apache QPAD dispatch router. So it, this is a, a network router that's using AMQP as a transport protocol. So this is using a session uh, level type of protocol for, uh, for implementing um, the transport for TCP, for example. And that's a very mature project that has, has uh, more than six years in, uh, out there as part of the uh, Apache Foundation. And the benefit of this, uh, this Scopper um, uh, components are that they are very lightweight and fast. So they use a small footprint that also makes them very appealing for um, direct implementations on uh, low, low uh, resource uh, devices and being able to, um, to be deployed uh, independently without having to use them as sidecars. So 
in uh, we have been mentioning that there's two them part main parts. So that we have integrated router that's coming from the Apache Cupid uh, project as the mature data plane that uh, uh, allows to us to implement this kind of connectivity. And on the other side, we have uh, the scoper uh, controllers and operators that are part of the control plane. That is the new uh, addition to the project that allows us to uh, be able to uh, leverage all the benefits from the uh, from the router and being able to do the automation of the configuration and the deployment and the uh, and the uh, auto configuration of, of the details of those kind of deployments on, on Kubernetes, for example. In that case, giving you the owner of the application control and agility on how to create your networking uh, topology. And this is very useful when we are talking about heterogeneous environments and indirect topologies. When we need to connect, for example, for the edge to edge case where we need to route our connection at, uh, through a network, but we don't want that network to access or be able to uh, reach those services. And also we just mentioned that we were uh, being able to run on top of Kubernetes or OpenShift, for example. And there's where things like, for example, your service mesh, it's super useful where you're working uh, through, uh, through that on, on a single um, OpenShift cluster. And even when you are working through uh, different uh, Kubernetes distributions, you might be able to use something like Mariner or even the, the same service mesh. But suddenly when we go outside the Kubernetes space and we need to suddenly incorporate uh, bare metal or virtual machines into our topology and be able um, to expand our services across this type of uh, despair um, uh, components, it's where things like the virtual application network, it's easier to configure, it's easier to set up. So now uh, that we have talked about what is Scoper, let's uh, see a demo of how it works. And I hope this makes it easier for, uh, for you to take, uh, to take a look on, on what is, is Scoper. Well, now it's time to see a virtual application network in action. In this case, I have an environment including three clouds. One, it's a private cloud that is running on my laptop, so it won't have um, any um, external exposure, so nobody can connect actually to my uh, local environment. Then we have a, an AKS cluster running on Azure. And finally, we have an OpenShift cluster uh, running on AWS. So in this case, we will start with the uh, local machine and creating a namespace called local. So we create um, namespace local. First, that there's no pods running and then initialize uh, the namespace using the copper CLI in a cluster local mode. Now it's time to go with the uh, Azure. Let's uh, create a namespace here called Azure. And then uh, let's initialize it using the uh, console with unsecure authentication. So we can provide a load balancer IP to access from external. Now with OpenShift, we can create an AWS namespace and then initialize it using the uh, Scoper CLI. In this case, it's uh, running locally. So we need to update this. To run from the local folder so it's dot slash scoper and now it didn't say slash two okay now we can uh, check the pods that are uh, being deployed and now we can see that there's a scoper router and a scoper service controller in my namespace let's um, then check the status so currently Scoper is in, in local edge mode here and it's not connected yet to any other system. So let's check um, the pods running on uh, Sure, it's, Again, we have the router and then let's check the status and it is um, available without connections. Time to check AWS with OpenShift. We can check that there's uh, the router pods running and then we can check the status that is it's available and ready to connect. Now for the connection, we need to um, get uh, the service information. So we can 
view that the uh, controller has an external IP, so we can select this uh, IP running on port 80 or 80. So we can go to our browser and then use that IP address in the port 8080 to check the uh, web console for Scopper. So this is the web console currently uh, listing the services and some more information about um, our configuration. Let's now create the uh, connection token for Azure. So this will create a secret with the information required to be uh, able to connect to Scopper. It has the uh, uh, endpoint name and the secret. So let's download this file called Azure secret secret and it's a YAML file. So we can download that from the um, AKS cluster. We can allow to download on our local system. So that's now in my local um, drive. So we can then uh, take a look at the, uh, at the YAML file. Let's uh, do a BI, Azure secret. And we can see there's a YAML version, Kubernetes uh, secret with information on how to get the uh, connection to this cluster. So let's use um, this uh, YAML file locally and then edit a file here in uh, my local system. In this case, we will be doing again a BI with the Azure secret YAML file. We just uh, paste this uh, the content of the uh, of the previous file that we just uh, download. Let's insert all the content. Let's then save this um, file, and then we can do the connection. So it's going to be Scopper Connect, and then we just provide the YAML file with all the information. In this case, we're going to name uh, the connection name local to Azure. So we can identify this easily. And then hit enter. And then the configuration is uh, ready to and connected. So we can check the status with Scopper CLI. And then we can see that it's connected to one other site and it, there's no services exposed yet. Let's do the exact same thing in uh, AWS in the OpenShift cluster. So in this case, we will be uh, creating the uh, sure secret. We're going to be pasting the exact same content. The information is the same. We save the file and then we can run Scopper Connect with the name AWS to Azure as the connection name. Now we can check the Scopper status for the OpenShift cluster. And then here we can see that now this cluster is connected to two other sites and one of those sites it's indirectly connected through the Azure site. So let's see on the console how we can now take a look at uh, these three clouds, these three uh, Kubernetes clusters that are running on my environment. So we can see the AWS cluster and the local and the um, AWS connected to Azure um, and they are all bridged together. So let's go back to the uh, local environment and create a deployment. It's going to be a backend service that is going to be just uh, replying to hello world. This is created in uh, two sites. We're going to create that in the local and also in the OpenShift site. So we also create a deployment here and then we have both uh, pods available uh, for high availability. In the local, we have the uh, backend pod, and also in the OpenShift cluster, we have the Hello World backend pod running. Now it's time to deploy the uh, um, the frontend. See, there's no pods running and on Azure. Let's create the uh, frontend deployment. This is uh, going to be the only pod running on the Azure cloud. So there's only the Hello World frontend. There's no other pods running here besides the router. So it's um, time to check the services. Again, there's only the uh, Scopper services available. And now let's start to um, 
expose using a scoper the deployment of the backend as part of the uh, scoper services and the uh, OpenShift uh, service to expose the deployment. And now this will create the services uh, around all the clouds to be available. So let's see in the local, the service it's already created. So it's hello world backend, this service cluster. Also again, on the OpenShift, there's a hello back world backend service created. And now this same uh, service should be um, available if we can see the list of exposed services we know that there's the hello world backend service and the application listening on the azure cloud we can take a look now on the uh, services here and we can see that there's the hello world backend service being created also in the azure cloud so we have the service all all the three clouds but there's no pod running here it's just the front end so we have the service it's virtualized service it's time to expose the deployment of the hello world front front end the port 8080 and then the uh, type will be load balancer load balancer Okay, this create the service for the uh, for the deployment. So if we see now the uh, services, we see that there's the backend service and the front end service. The front end service has a cluster, an external IP address, so we can use that to access the um, front end service. That is just a simple um, get call. We can go to the our browser. Uh, we type in the uh, external IP address port eighty eighty. And then we can see that it loads the application. Let's do it a little bit bigger. So we can see that's uh, just a single message uh, showing the uh, name of the pod that is uh, currently answering this request. So if we do uh, a refresh, we can see that uh, there's also a counter and information about the uh, pod name. So let's see which one it's answering. So in the local uh, cluster, we can get the pods. We can see that the pod name corresponds to the uh, pod name being shown by the application. So in this case, the front-end application, it's been tunneled through Scopper to the uh, local cluster in my laptop running and then being able to access uh, that service. Uh, if we go to the uh, to the console, we can see that the uh, destination of the site, it's my local cluster. So it's the cluster that it's currently answering those requests and how is it flowing. To check the uh, um, high availability, let's uh, scale the deployment. Hello world backend. And then put the replicas on zero. So we can simulate a shortage in the system. So this will uh, scale down the service. Uh, we can try calling the application again. It will uh, respond until the uh, part it's uh, it's been is it's terminated in the moment that the uh, pod is terminated then the application will automatically reroute from the uh, local cluster which is not available to the openshift cluster now we can see there's uh, a new pod uh, uh, answering back and we saw the uh, update in the uh, in the screen so let's just verify that it's the sex pod that is running so we get pods and yeah, the name is exactly the same as the pod that it's currently running in the OpenShift cluster. So from Azure, it's now calling the AWS service uh, cluster. And let's uh, get back the uh, local service and let's uh, do a failback. Let's uh, restart and check that it's uh, still answering on the OpenShift cluster. And we can see it's still that one answering back. And then let's scale back the uh, service running on top of OpenShift. So let's scale, scale, deployment, hello world backend. Great. 
replicas replicas equals zero and now that there's no pod running on OpenShift we should be uh, filling back again to the local um, cluster running on my laptop and here it is now the cluster that is answering black it's uh, my own laptop amazing right okay after we have seen uh, how this uh, load balancing and across different uh, clouds works with scoper that we can do uh, private to a public cloud and load balancing those kind of things that the virtual application network allows us to have without having to mess up with the uh, actual network topology. These are the three key takeaways that I really want to, you to take uh, after this session. So if you want to use a scoper, it, it is best if you use a scoper when your data sources are running in a mix of uh, different environments and you cannot move them, like you know having data gravity in your databases and, and such. Or when you have uh, you can you can have access to your data sources by changing the networking at layer three. So services that are already available at certain uh, IPs or host names, and then we need to be accessed in in the exact same way. But your applications needs to outgrow that that requirement. And finally, uh, for example, you can use a scoper when suddenly you need to expand your administrative domains that you don't control. Like if you want to connect your two namespaces, but you are not the owner of the underlying uh, network infrastructure uh, and, and you're limited to just uh, your space, that's where Scopper can be leveraged to, uh, to get this type of connectivity. All right, I think our time is so, it's over. I really appreciate that you, uh, you hang with us uh, during this time. And uh, here is uh, some more information, some more links if you want to follow our work uh, around, uh, either YouTube, uh, Twitter, blog posts, and, and, and contact us uh, offline. And now I think uh, we can take some uh, question and answers and uh, maybe continue the conversation. So thank you very much and see you later.